Good morning, everybody. This is Jim McGowan from Ray Marine. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar topic, Get On Course, Autopilot Technology for Every Boat. We'll get started in about uh, 20 seconds or so. I see the room filling up with participants. Thank you all for turning out. So we're going to pause just for a second and get, make yourselves comfortable, and uh, we'll get started in just a little bit. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jim McGowan with Ray Marine. Welcome to the next installment of our 2020 webinar series. Today's topic, autopilot technology. And with me today, I have a returning special guest. Uh, Derek Gilbert is the manager of our technical support group based out of our UK offices. Good morning or good afternoon, Derek. How are you? Yeah, good afternoon, Jim. Yeah, I'm absolutely fine. Thanks, mate. Enjoying this nice sunny day over here. So uh, great to be on board with you. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate having your expertise in house as we talk about autopilots. And I know you've got a lot of experience with them and uh, um, a lot of good advice you'll be able to offer us today. So thanks for coming out. So today we're going to be talking about Raymarine autopilot technology and certainly that goes back quite a long way. We were really one of the pioneers uh, in, in autopilot tech. And our latest generation product is our Evolution Series autopilots. Um, so let's take a look at some of the basic components that make up one of these autopilot systems. So first up, this is our EV sensor core that we're looking at. And Derek, can you tell me a little bit about it? Um, what's the function of the EV sensor core in the autopilot system? Okay, well, this is really the heart of the autopilot. Um, it's the brain of the operation, if you like. Um, it has the course computer built into it, and it contains also the uh, main sensors, which we'll talk about in a little while, um, for controlling the pilot, giving its heading direction, and that sort of thing. So it, it's, uh, it's really a smart device in itself. It's very different from some of the compass units that prior generations of products have had. Yeah, that's sure. We, we used to use a flux gate compass, which is about the size of a tennis ball. Um, it was black and had a, a flat side on it. Um, this is a little bit larger. The, the main sensor part, if you like, is the black part you see in the middle and the white all around it. That is the uh, mounting bracket that holds it in place. Um, and unlike the flux gate compasses of the old pilots that used to output a, uh, an analog signal to the course computer, this has all the electronics inside, so it outputs um, CTORC NG, which is compatible with NME A2000, um, and it plugs into the um, network, the CTORC NG network on the boat through a spur cable connection, and that's where it gets both its power from and it communicates through. That's pretty cool, and, and I understand that there's actually quite a lot going on inside the sensor core. What types of sensors do we actually have in there? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's got three main sets of sensors. Each of them work on a, uh, on a three axes. So you've got a digital accelerometer inside there. You've got a, uh, like a digital compass or a magnetometer inside there. And um, you've also got a, uh, a digital gyro sensor as well. So this, this EV1 sensor is able to not only pick up heading, but also the rate of change of the heading, it's able to pick up the healing angle of the boat, um, all sorts of information like that, which it fuses together to give you really super accurate heading information. That's pretty cool. Now I know that, um, again, unlike the old sensors, this one has a lot more flexibility on where you can actually position it and mount it on the boat. What are some of the options for the EV sensor core? Yeah, it, it can be mounted either on a, on a bulkhead, um, it can be um, surface mounted as well, and you can mount it above or below decks depending on what the material of the boat is. I mean, obviously, if it's a steel boat, you'd want to mount it above the steel hull. Um, but you, you've got to mount it so that it, it's horizontal. So when you put it on a surface or on a bulkhead, you've got to get that top surface 
within about five degrees of being horizontal fore and aft and a, and a thwart chip so that the sensors have the greatest range of, of operation um, and also improves their accuracy. Okay, and uh, I know you mentioned the steel hull and, and getting it mounted up around there. With Evolution, it's certainly um, a huge improvement in accuracy and capability over older systems, but is this compass immune to magnetic interference or do we have to give it some special considerations when we mount it? No, really, really, we should treat it like um, a, a traditional compass sensor. It, it will be affected by other magnetic forces, um, ferrous materials, cables that are carrying high currents, um, other sensors. Um, you've got to be careful when you mount it on a bulkhead. What's on the other side of the bulkhead? Are there loudspeakers, fire extinguisher? And you've also got to think what's underneath and around the boat as well. So. Um, have you got a steel keel or what about those two big engines you're close to? So really the sort of the general rule of thumb that you had for the flux gate compass, you, you'd sort of aim to mount it near the pitch and roll center of the boat, but then you'd work your way aft, outboard and up to get it clear of interference. And ideally if you had, if you imagined a, uh, a two meter or six foot diameter sphere, with nothing magnetic or ferrous inside that sphere, that would be the ideal position at the middle of that sphere for the EV1 sensor. And clearly that isn't gonna happen on a boat. So it's a bit of a compromise, but also built into this EV1 sensor, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later as well, um, is a calibration process so that it will compensate for some of the local deviating forces that affect the compass. Um, and it will then take that into account to give you a, it, a very accurate heading. Yeah, I guess that, that is really the advantage of EV1 too, is you know, in addition to the, the sensor pack that's in there is the fact that it has a lot of smarts that the older compasses did not have. So it can, it can manage that interference a lot better and compensate for it. Yeah, it, it really is the, the key part to an autopilot. The better the compass heading, the um, better the performance of the autopilot. If you have a, a rubbish uh, heading output, your autopilot, you can do everything you like with it. You won't get it to steer properly. So it's worthwhile spending some time trying to find the right location for it. And if you're in any doubt, then you can use a, a compass application on your smartphone. You can... Um, even temporarily just mount it on a, a cardboard box with some gaffer tape and just move that around to find the best place to, to mount it on the boat. Um, once you've got that, then you're in business, you know you've got great heading, and then you know the autopilot's got the best chance to give you super good performance. Excellent, those are some great tips. So um, let's look at some of the other components in the autopilot system and the types of pilots that Raymarine offers as well. Um, so the first group I wanted to talk about are what we call a cockpit autopilot system. Um, and we'll sometimes see terminology, cockpit systems, below deck systems. What's the main difference between those two types, Derek? Okay, well, the, the cockpit systems, they're designed, as the name would suggest, to be mounted up in the cockpit. Um, they're attached to the tiller by a, a pin and just simply held in place by resting the end of the autopilot on a pin. Um, or they're, they're mounted on the actual steering wheel um, of the, the boat itself. And they're designed to be out in the weather, they're exposed to the elements, and they are very much uh, an aid. So it's something you need to supervise to keep an eye on them. They're, um, you know, if the, the wind gets up, you've got to take a bit of a reef in, um, you've got to uh, ease the main sheet down the traveller, that sort of thing, just to uh, treat them with a bit of respect. Because they, when you look at the size of them, you've got a, a motor the size of a, uh, an a size battery. Um, so you, you've got to take a, a bit of care over them in order to get the best from them. Your below decks pilots are, are something completely different. You've got a much more powerful drive unit. And you could really think of a below decks pilot as replacing a crew person. Um, you want something that's going to helm the boat securely and safely in a, in a really heavy blow. And when things get nasty, that's when a properly installed, correctly specified below decks pilot really is important. And the below decks pilots, as the name suggests, they're installed with the majority of the components are out of sight, uh, behind consoles, in the lazarette, um, down in the steering flat. 
and you have a control unit, um, which we'll talk about later, but you have a control unit um, in the cockpit, which is really all you see for it. It's much more built into the boat than a, a cockpit pilot, which is a kind of add-on to the boat. So I know cockpit pilot systems, they're you know, really popular with, uh, well, for example, a tiller steered sailboat, like we see in the picture here, or a wheel steered sailboat. Um, can these devices network with other electronics, like my chart plotter or my instruments? Yeah, they can. Um, you, you just need to be aware some of them have slightly different data protocol. The tiller pilots use CTORC. Um, the uh, evolution-based products all use CTORC NG or Enemy A2000, um, but you can very easily link them up to the rest of the network on your boat. You can link your instruments into them so that um, you can use wind information, more of that later, um, and you can link them into your chart plotter as well. So yeah, absolutely. They can be run as a standalone unit or they can be built into your network. Okay. And how would I at least begin to sum up if a cockpit pilot is the right fit for my boat? What are some of the things I should be thinking about? Okay. Uh, the first thing, obviously, is you need to look at your steering and decide, you know, which is the right um, drive unit for you. Is it tiller steered, in which case a tiller actuator is the thing you need, or wheel steered, and you'll use the, uh, the wheel pilot. Um, so steering is, is really important. And then you've got to look at what the boat displacement is. Now, I, I hear a lot of times questions from consumers at shows, especially, you know, uh, I've got a pretty big sailboat, but I've got super light steering. You know, I can steer it with, with my pinky finger. Um, and they're some, often looking at some of these uh, smaller cockpit pilot systems. Um, what do you think about a scenario like that? Yeah, it's, it's very easy to, to go down that route. Um, but uh, the real key thing is the boat displacement. And we have to look very closely at, at what the boat actually weighs, not only the design displacement, but also everything else that gets put onto the boat as well. Because, you know, when a, a heavy wave, a large sea hits the rudder, it's actually the boat, the, the weight of the boat, the inertia of the whole thing that defines the forces that are generated. Um, and you can get some very substantial back drive forces through the rudder, through the tiller, through the wheel. Uh, and it's that that causes the damage. So whilst you might think your steering is very light when you're, you're ghosting and in light weather conditions, you really do need to choose the right size pilot for the boat um, so that it can deal with things when the seas get up and, and when things sort of start going wrong. Um, you know, I've, I've seen tiller pilots used on vane steering. I've seen uh, wheel pilots used on very large boats. But it's always on the, the understanding that those are used in ghosting conditions, very specific conditions. Um, if you were sailing down sea with a quartering sea, you know, maybe a, a fresh force four or five and your boat's over the specification, uh, the displacement limit, that autopilot's really going to struggle and you should really be using a below decks pilot. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the below decks options. Um, we'll start off with uh, mechanical drive units and some of these are actually, I guess, kind of similar in how they operate, at least on a fundamental level, uh, to what we're doing up there in the cockpit. Um, wh what are the two kind of drive units that we see here in the mechanical okay, line? The Okay, Jeremy, yeah, the two that you can see here is uh, on the left hand side there, you've got the rotary drive with a sprocket on the, uh, the output. And the drive below it is a mechanical linear drive. They're, um, they're both mechanical drives, uh, so they've both got electric motors in there. There's no hydraulics in them at all. Um, and the rotary drive is designed to operate with that sprocket and chain, and the linear drive is a push pull mechanism. So if you like, they're much bigger versions of what we saw for the cockpit, where we had a rotating wheel drive and a push-pull tiller drive unit. Um, and there are things that we need to, to do to make sure that they are installed and used correctly. Yeah, so I've heard that these types of drive units can generate some pretty exceptional forces. They have a lot of mechanical advantage going on in there. Um, do we need to have a structure to mount these two? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, both of them use uh, fairly powerful electric motors. They drive through uh, 
um, a, a, an epicyclic gearbox. Um, and that's what magnifies the torque, if you like, from the motor. So from a rotary drive, you're putting a lot of rotationary torque onto the um, steering system. So the, the pulleys and shivs that you use need to have appropriate bearings in. You can't just run a steering cable around the uh, sprocket and hope that that will work. It needs to be professionally engineered into the um, steering system with cable and chain spliced into the steering um, or, or a bevel gearbox. And the linear drive, again, you need to have some proper shipwright work carried out in order to make sure that drive unit is spreading its thrust um, over the, the structure of the boat. Um, and also you need to be very wary when you're uh, connecting the drive unit to the tiller bar. You can see in the picture there uh, an auxiliary tiller bar attached to the rudder stock. And you, the reason why that um, occurs is if you start drilling holes uh, willy-nilly in rudder quadrants, it's likely you can create a stress point and trigger a failure. Rudder quadrants these days are designed very carefully by the naval architects and the engineers to spread the steering loads appropriately around that um, circumference of the quadrant and you go then drill a hole in it you you could create an issue so we really do need to have some proper shipwright work carried out um, and the mounting of a drive unit there may only be four bolts in the mounting foot of that drive but that needs to be secured in a way that it, it's attached to both um, horizontal and longitudinal bulkheads in the boat or a nice big um, thick mounting plate of either stainless or aluminium um, to spread the load over the structure that it's bolted to. I, I've seen mounting feet bolted um, literally to the side of the boat and as a drive unit operates you can see the hull panting in and out. Um, well there's only one sure thing that's going to happen for that and in a heavy seaway that drive unit is going to punch its way right out the side of the boat and you're going to have a lot more problems than just an autopilot that's not steering at that moment in time. Oh, I've also yeah, seen I've also <laughs> seen um, tiller bars um, that have been under engineered and I've seen those bent in a heavy seaway as well. So even though driving it can probably output a thrust of somewhere around about a third getting on for half a ton, the compressive loads that you can get in a heavy seaway on a 50 or 60 foot boat can be two or three tons quite easily. Um, and you've got to find a way of spreading that load. And as long as you use professional advice, you get professional fitters and shipwrights, it's really not a problem. So with these mechanical systems too, it looks like everything is pretty rigid there. I see the linear drive anchored to the, uh, the extension bar. Uh, imagine that rotary drive bolts down. Um, when the autopilot's not in use, do these systems drag on the steering? Well, no, that's the great thing about it, because built into the drive unit, both of them have um, a, uh, an electric clutch, electromagnetic clutch. And so what happens is when the autopilot's disengaged, the clutch disengages the vast majority of the mechanism inside the drive unit. And so largely, you'll hardly even feel the drive unit is attached to the steering when you're steering the boat by hand. They're really very, very light. Um, and, you know, it, it's very effective in terms of decoupling it from the, uh, the steering system. Okay. And when I'm shopping for the right drive unit from my, for my boat, I noticed there's a lot of terminology about type one drives and type two drives. And I see some have 12 volts, 24 volts, uh, long stroke, short stroke. How do I know what I need to use yeah. to, to make it work. Again, as we, we mentioned with um, tiller pilot, uh, cockpit pilots and tiller pilots, that sort of thing, you, you've got to go by the loaded displacement of the boat. Um, you, you can, a rough rule of thumb is you can add 20% or so to the displacement of the boat to compensate for it. Once you know the displacement, that will point you in the right direction of the drive unit. Um, once you know the size of drive unit, whether it's a type one or type two, then you obviously need to check your operating voltage. There are a number of boats built with uh, 24 volts. Um, and so you make sure that you select the appropriate voltage for that drive unit to fit into the boat. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. 
So let's, uh, we've talked a lot about mechanical units and, uh, and a lot of sales specific autopilot information. Let's take a look at some stuff that are really common on power boats. So hydraulic drive systems. So um, we were just talking a moment ago about type one, type two and 12 and 24 volt. It looks like there's some options in hydraulic autopilots as well. Um, what's, uh, what kind of configurations do we commonly see, Derek? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. The, there are a variety of sizes, um, and this caters for the different sizes of hydraulic rams in the steering system. Um, there are a whole variety uh, of hydraulic steering systems, and maybe that's a, a topic for, for another day. But the long and the short is that depending on the cubic capacity of the steering ram, that will determine what size of hydraulic pump you're using. So that's interesting. It's a little bit different from the mechanical drives where the weight of the boat was the key factor. So here it's steering cylinder volume. Am I hearing you right there? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Because we rely on the boat builder choosing the correct size steering cylinder to operate the steering of the boat. And that's based around things like the displacement of the boat, the rudder torque, and that will be determined by the number of engines, the boat speed, the power of the engines, um, whether you're using out drives, um, shaft drives, etc. So the, the boat builder will choose the correct size hydraulic cylinder um, to control the boat when it's underway at high speed and in the worst conditions. Um, and so that, the size of that cylinder then determines the size of pump that we, uh, we specify for it. Okay, yeah, I guess that makes sense because with uh, you know a larger cylinder, we're going to need a, a bigger pump that pumps more volume, um, and and that, that way it fills the cylinder at a pretty consistent rate uh, as well. Okay, yeah, that, the the key to that is the what we refer to as the hard overtime, um, which is the time it takes for the autopilot pump to move the um, rudders, if you like, from harder port to harder starboard. That's the hard overtime. And there, there's a bit of a, a sweet spot, a bit of an envelope that, that we like to aim for to give you the best autopilot control. And if you're much quicker than that, then the drive unit will be flipping backwards and forwards like a landed fish. If it's much slower than that, then the boat's going to be wandering lazily all around the ocean and um, you're, you're going to get pretty fed up with the steering. So our aim is to try and make sure that you fit the right volume if you like, the right displacement, um, the right performance hydraulic pump to your steering cylinder. So you get the right hard over time, which then means the autopilot has got a great chance to steer your boat properly. Okay. Now, when I was looking at hydraulic systems last night before the webinar, I noticed that we have in our lineup something called a constant running pump. Uh, it looks like it's significantly bigger than the other pumps. Uh, looks like it's a little more expensive too. Um, how would I know if I need something like that? Yeah, again, it comes down to displacement. Um, you, you reach a, a kind of a cutoff area where around about half a, half a liter or so between sort of 350 to 400 cc's. Um, I'm, I can't do my math quickly to tell you what that is in cubic inches. But uh, basically you get to a size of RAM where there is so much fluid that needs to be moved. In order to move that fluid quickly, you use what we call a constant running pump. And basically what that is, is an electric motor that's running continuously. Um, and there's a pump module attached to that motor. And all the time that motor's running, the high pressure oil is simply circulating around a small system. As soon as the autopilot wants to steer left or right, um, it operates a solenoid attached to that pump and it then directs that high pressure fluid to the port or starboard side of the ram and it gives you a like an almost instant uh, application of fluid to, to move the ram to port and starboard. And it's simply down to system inertia. You reach a point where uh, what we call the, the smaller pumps are all what we call reversing pumps. So in order to turn the rudder one way, the pump motor spins in one direction. To turn it the other way, the pump motor spins the other direction. Um, with a constant running pump, the pump motor is turning the same direction all the time, generating this high pressure oil. And that gives you, that overcomes the inertia you have in these very large steering cylinders. 
Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now I noticed there is a another kind of hydraulic drive out there, though it looked like maybe it was more of a sailing or maybe even older style powerboat drive. It was called a hydraulic linear drive, kind of a hybrid setup. What's a common application for something like that? Yeah, hydraulic linears generally tend to find their way onto mechanical steering systems. So you reach a point in terms of boat displacement where a mechanical linear, again, just runs out of grunt at um, extreme conditions. So in that case, we then move over to a hydraulic linear. And these basically are a, a, a built together system where you have a hydraulic ram, you have a bypass valve, you have a hydraulic pump and a reservoir, and it's all assembled, it's all pre-assembled, it's all pre-filled with hydraulic oil, it's all pre-bled. So you can kind of take this thing out of the box and fit this to your ram um, on your, your cylinder, uh, sorry, your quadrant. Um, and typically you're looking at boats that are gonna be 55, 60 feet and upwards, but it really does depend around the, the displacement of the boat. Um, will determine whether you need a mechanical linear or a hydraulic linear. Um, and again, these rams are specially built so they have low friction uh, seals inside. So again, you have minimal drag on the steering system when the, uh, the autopilot is in standby mode and you're, you're basically freewheeling the, the autopilot. Okay, yeah, so it really, once again, kind of comes down to just the size of the boat, displacement, performance characteristics, and you know, it, it sounds we have very an option crude. for everyone. Yeah, yeah, it sounds very crude, but but displacement of the boat is the first thing that um, you you need to to get sorted out. Displacement of the boat and steering type. And one thing, perhaps, I should have mentioned about the linear drives, and it goes the same goes for the hydraulic linear as well. If you're not sure whether you can fit that linear drive to the steering of your boat, because some steering systems use a, a bevel gearboxes, some of them use worm drives. Um, the simple way of telling whether you can fit a, a mechanical linear to your, your quadrant is get down in the lazarette, put your foot against the quadrant and give it a push. And with the boat alongside, if it's a bit of a grunt, you know that a linear drive will work. If you go red in the face and you've got to use two feet to push it and it's a real strain, then nah, something's wrong there. It's either the wrong drive or your steering system is really, really stiff. And, th and that's possible as well. Your steering cables could be too tight. Your um, rudder stock bearings could have swollen and could be gripping the rudder stock. So, you know, if you're concerned that your drive unit is not working properly on the boat, again, those are all things to, to check out uh, and make sure before you go as far as fitting your, your linear drive into it. Okay. So we've looked at all the different options for drive units and there's another component in an evolution system called an ACU or an actuator control unit. So what does this box do for us? Okay, so the, the drive unit needs to get its, its power from somewhere um, because it, it can take quite a few amps. When, you, when you're working under heavy load, you can be drawing you know, 20 or 30 odd amps uh, for a very short period of time. And you've got to have something that, that is controlling that supply of current. So basically what happens is the EV1 sensor sends its commands in terms of heading um, and course keeping to the ACU. The ACU then outputs the heavy power to the autopilot drives in order to tell it which way to drive and also to operate the clutch um, and those sorts of things. Ah, okay. So I see there's a bunch of different connections on the ACU. So I would assume at least one of those is to connect up to the drive and the clutch on the right. What are some of those other color coded ones down there? Okay, you know, the color coding is, is really good because all of the cables that Raymarine use are all color coded. So um, at the left hand end next to that purple fuse, you, you have connections for your CTORC NG network. Um, so that's where your spur cable connects into. So when you've got your EV sensor plugged into your backbone, the backbone runs through the boat and then a spur cable comes off that backbone and connects to the CTORC NG connection just on the left hand side there. You've also got uh, clutch connections on there. You've got connections on there as well for um, your um, 
kill your there's a, like a sleep switch you can also use as well you've also got clutch connections there too okay and i know we have a few different flavors of acus and i suppose that that they vary depending on what drive unit you have on the other end right yeah absolutely uh, for example we have an acu 300 which is a solenoid system so actually you don't have a reversing drive output you have solenoid a and b connectors so you you'll have the the relevant connectors on there for the things that you're needing to do okay now for folks that may have had an autopilot in the past maybe they have uh, one of our older generations of autopilots um, we used to have something called a course computer and the course computer looks a lot like this ACU that we see on the slide. Uh, are they the same thing? Yeah, yeah, we, we've used very similar moldings uh, over the years. Um, but no, they, they are quite different because the course computer that we used to have, that, that was the brain of the whole network as well as the power amplifier, as well as the central connection area. Um, and so what we used to do was we connect our flux gate to it, our rudder reference unit to it, um, joysticks to it, all that sort of stuff. The ACU is purely a, a motor control unit, actuator control unit is what ACU stands for. Uh, yeah, that's on the slide too. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, it, it also acts as a connection point. So you've got your controlling system connecting into it through CTORC NG. You've got your rudder reference unit connected to it. And then you've got your drive motor connections as well. Okay. Yeah. So it looks dissimilar, but uh, looks like the old one, but very different uh, function in the network. Yeah. Yeah. Just one point to, uh, to go back to on that as well. You may have noticed on the back of the ACU, um, along the bottom, you can see like a ripple effect. Um, those, are the, those are the fins. We always recommend that these are mounted on a vertical surface so that the fins are vertical. Because when these things are working hard on a big boat in a heavy seaway, the back plate of that is metal and is um, a heat sink. So you mount it vertically, the fins are vertical, and you get some airflow going around it. So a quick tip with that is don't mount it at the bottom of a locker and then stick all your dirty washing on top of it. You need to get some airflow around it. Okay, yeah, hang it on the bulkhead and yeah, the way the air can go right up the backside. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great, a great tech tip. So I know there's um, a lot of boats out there today that are using something totally different for steering. Um, they call it drive-by-wire. Can you explain to us what drive-by-wire technology is? Yeah, there's uh, more and more uh, power boats now where you have a, a drive unit that's kind of fully integrated. It's almost like a pod that, that bolts on the underside of the hull and the engine and gearbox sit on top of it inside the boat. Um, and there's no actual tiller bar to control the, the steering of it. The, the direction of this pod, which some of them can azimuth fully 360 degrees, um, that's all controlled by the engine control system within the engine itself. Um, there can either be solenoids within the engine or there's e electronic drive engines within the engine. All of that's within the engine. And so traditionally, where you try and fit a drive unit, there's nowhere to fit it. Um, so what we then do is we provide an electronic system to tap into those electronics on the engine um, and we just feed it steering impulses, if you like, drive by wire. Ah, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, we just interface directly to the engine and tell it which way it needs to turn. Yeah. I've seen yeah. a lot of these in the, in the, in the different boating media lately, the newest, uh, like Dometic just brought out, they call it Optimus electric steering for outboards, which is kind of neat. Uh, I know Volvo Penta has had this for a while. ZF, uh, I think even Yanmar, uh, has this. Um, Beneteau sailboats even have something, I think, that has a, a pod drive very similar that uses drive-by-wire. So it's, uh, yeah. it's pretty neat. So mm. it looks like the main difference here is that there is mm. no ACU and no drive unit from Raymarine. It's a pure electronic interface. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, instead of using the EV1 sensor, we've got a sensor called the EV2. Huh. Um, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to what the EV1 does. The EV2 has a bit extra in it. Um, it has a second port on it, which is what you then connect in, sometimes through an interface, sometimes directly, depending on the type of engine um, and the setup. But the second port will then 
connect through to the engine electronics and enable the autopilot uh, to control it. So in these cases, basically, you just have a control head and the EV2 sensor. Wow, that's a pretty simple system, but very effective. Yeah. Very good. So there's one more autopilot component that pops up from time to time that we haven't really talked about uh, in terms of the sensors, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the rudder reference transducer. And it used to be that, you know, every single autopilot had a rudder reference of some kind. And I understand today that this device isn't always needed. So what does the rudder reference transducer actually do for us in a traditional autopilot? Yeah, traditionally, it's, it's just a very basic component, really. It's got a potentiometer inside. Um, it's attached through some linkage to the rudder quadrant or to some part of the steering mechanism. So it feeds one-to-one -one position information of exactly where the rudder is um, to the potentiometer, which then goes to the ACU. The ACU then knows exactly where the rudder is. Um, and as you say, all autopilots traditionally used to use one of these. It was kind of like mandatory um, so that you knew what the rudder position was all the time. So um, in an evolution system, I guess this part is now optional. Um, so how, what are we doing in place of using a physical rudder reference unit? Okay, so what we do um, is we are able to create what we call a virtual rudder angle. Um, and we do that using some fairly clever algorithms in our software, but the, the fact that we get such um, accurate information coming back from our EV1, plus some clever algorithms within it, we're able to calculate virtually where the rudder is based on what is happening to the boat. Uh, and using that, we then control our, our autopilot from there. Um, so we have a, a virtual rudder position. So if you notice when you look on your control unit, in standby mode, you've got no rudder angle. In auto, you'll see that there's a rudder angle appears. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because it's uh, virtually calculating it when the autopilot's engaged. Okay, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. So, and I understand um, a lot of our autopilot systems come, come kitted up. So you'll, you'll get an ACU and you'll get an EV1 and other things in the box. And it looks like this rudder reference transducer uh, sometimes is included, sometimes it's not. I guess it depends on what type of uh, application it's gonna have in the other end. So yeah, there are times when with, you may wanna use yeah. this, huh? Yeah, typically with the, the ACU 100, that's used with the tiller drive cockpit pilots and the wheel pilots. And typically those are unusual to, to have a rudder reference unit fitted. Um, with the hydraulic steering systems, again, the, the ACU 150, um, because you're, you're fitting to a lot of outboard motors in a lot of cases, again, you, you won't have a rudder reference unit normally required. Once you get up to the larger boats, particularly with mechanical steering, um, then you'll start seeing the rudder reference unit used more often. Um, there's various reasons. The, the rudder reference unit can do really useful things like apart from giving you a rudder angle position um, when you're in standby mode, um, it'll also give you an electronic end stop. So particularly when you have these really powerful hydraulic linear drives and the big type two uh, mechanical linear drives, if they push the steering into the mechanical end stops and in the picture here, you can see that there's a, a bit of steel work bolted to the deckhead uh, with a number of hexagon bolts there. And there's a, uh, on the quadrant, you've got a, uh, a pin with a bit of rubber around it. That's your mechanical end stop. And the idea is that the, um, the autopilot uses information from the feedback unit to stop driving before it hits the mechanical end stop so that you're, you're not straining that at all. That end stop is there purely when you're manually steering. Um, you get in, you know, you might have found it sometimes when you're backing a boat down. Um, if you let go of the steering wheel, not something I'd advise you to do, but if you did while the boat's going astern, um, with a mechanically steered boat, suddenly you'll find the wheel will go banging over hard port or starboard. And that's what the end stop is there to, to prevent, protect against. Um, okay. So the rudder reference unit gives you a, an ability there to provide electronic end stops. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, one other point, actually, is that some steering systems as well, depending on the age, you might have a lot of free play. Um, if you have a hydraulic steering system that's not brand new, you might find that you've got um, a bit of oil seeping past some seals, a bit of air in the system, all those sorts of things. You could have a bit of slack in your steering cables or chains. Um, all of that slack in it will confuse a, an autopilot that hasn't got a feedback system because you've got this, this slop. It's like trying to drive your car uh, down a motorway or a freeway. And if you imagine that you had to keep on sawing your steering wheel backwards and forwards to keep the car in a straight line. If anybody's had an old Land Rover Defender, you'll know exactly what I mean. <laughs> You drive along the road like this all the time, keeping in a straight line. What the rudder reference unit does is it picks up the accurate position of the rudder and it bypasses all of that free play in the steering system and tells the ACU exactly where the rudder is. So, you know, it, it has a good part to play um, on systems that, that have a bit of flexibility, a bit of free play. In. That's pretty good. And apologies to Land Rover. And we certainly have a lot of, uh, lot hey, of pickup pickup trucks on the road here in America that have those yeah. same characteristics too. <laughs> hey, it's part of their endearing character. I wouldn't there lose it for, for anything, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we've been looking at a lot of components that are below decks, things that you don't see very much, right? They get installed and they're hidden away. And, and pretty much all the components that we've looked at to this point too are things that you don't have a lot of choice when you buy them. The boat kind of decides for you that you need this drive unit and this ACU. And um, now we get to the, uh, the human interface of the system. Here we've got the autopilot controllers. Um, so we've got two of them in the Raymarine line. We've got P70RS and P70S. What's the difference between these, Derek? Uh, okay, the, the difference is simply one is push button and one has a rotary knob. Um, in order to input the heading to it. So um, as a user, you, you get a choice between either of these. In fact, you could have both. Um, there's nothing to stop you having both and you can have as many as you like um, on the, the boat. The, the difference between them is simply down to one's push button operated and one's rotary knob. You might notice in the picture there, one's got a different color display um, both of them have the opportunity to change the color on the display. That's all part of the customization that you as a user can carry out to get a display that suits what you like to see. And traditionally, I think a lot of people uh, assume that the push button pilot is for sailboats and the rotary knob pilot is for power boats. Is that, does that hold true or can you pick whatever yeah. you like? Uh, you, you can pick whatever you like. Um, it's interesting you, you say that point because, um, yeah, tradition does kind of come in here. People are used to a particular type of operation on a particular type of boat. Um, I guess the main reason for not finding too many controllers with the rotary knobs um, in the cockpits of sailing boats is the worry that if you have a, a sheet or a halyard flapping around or jerking around in the cockpit um, in, a, in a high wind, that could catch around the control knob and damage it. It's pretty unlikely, but I think that was kind of what the, the, the thought process was um, of some people. And, and tradition has kind of stuck over the last 40 years or so. Okay, but in reality, you can you can use any controller in any kind of boat. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So the controllers have been kind of a mainstay of autopilot systems, you know, since the very beginning. But I know on modern integrated systems, we can actually do away with the controllers now. So our Lighthouse 3 system, for example, in Axiom has this little slide out uh, keypad. Um, what are some of the things I can do from Axiom to control my autopilot, Derek? Yeah, this is a really neat feature. And if you're you're short of uh, real estate on your dash area, this, this could really help you. Um, there's a number of, of controls on there. You can obviously select auto standby. Um, you can change course. You can um, select a, a waypoint so you can track to a waypoint or even follow a route. 
So most of those functions um, are available uh, on there. And through the Axiom, you can also do a full calibration of the autopilot as well. So that's actually a pretty good solution. And I think you brought up a great point there. A lot of boats today don't have a lot of space at the helm. And I guess if you have the choice between, um, you know, a small MFD with an, and then a dedicated autopilot controller or just having a bigger MFD, uh, I know personally I would go for the bigger MFD because it's a lot more exciting to look at than the autopilot yes. controller. Yeah. So yeah, yeah definitely, most definitely. definitely yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I'd go with that. Um, there's, there's one or two features that you, you wouldn't be able to access through that. The, the particularly advanced capabilities in terms of sail to wind, auto tack, um, or even the trolling patterns for when you're fishing, they, they wouldn't be accessible. So that might be a reason for you to have a control unit perhaps by somewhere else um, on a cockpit combing or on your tuna tower or, or something like that. Yeah, I guess that's something too that is nice about the system and the way it goes together is because those autopilot controllers are just CTOC NG devices like an instrument, you can really mount them anywhere. So it doesn't necessarily have to be right there in front of you. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, as long as you can get access to the SeaTalk NG backbone running through the boat, you can put a, a T piece in, run a spur cable to your controller, and there you go. Easy as that. That's pretty good. So another option I know that's really popular, in fact, just this, this past week, I've talked to three or four people about wireless control for autopilots. And we've had these out for quite a while, and uh, um, people seem to like them. So we've got the S100, which uh, that person is holding in their hand, and we have Smart Controller, which is the bigger one on the screen. Um, what are some of the chief differences between these two, Derek? Uh, okay, the, um, the Smart Controller is, is quite a basic controller in terms of it, its functionality and the information it will display. The Smart Controller can also be used, the larger one can also be used to display some of your navigation information, some of the uh, wind, depth, speed, compass information on it, whereas the smart controller has a much smaller display um, and largely is, is there for just controlling the pilot. Okay, and I think too the smart controller, the larger one, is actually rechargeable where the smaller one uh, runs on disposable batteries, so that might be a consideration, yeah. I suppose, yeah. depending on how often you use it. And that device yeah, on the right. You, yeah, sorry, oh, uh, sorry, Jim. Yeah, you you could use the smart controller um, with it with it plugged in if you if you wish to as well. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good capability. I didn't even think of. And that device on the right, that RF base, that's the receiver unit for it. Yeah, that's right. That'll be. Um, I would like to say buried somewhere in the boat, but actually buried is the wrong word. It, it needs to be somewhere where um, the, the wireless signal isn't going to get attenuated. So definitely not a good idea to bury it uh, down below in a lead box or a, uh, a, you know, a, a carbon pod. Um, it should be somewhere where it's got a, um, a good signal strength. And you can see the signal strength on the displays of the uh, remotes there as well. So one of the things you should check before you, you screw it to a bulkhead is make sure you've got good signal strength in the areas where you want to use it. Okay. And I noticed the, uh, the remote comes with a lanyard so that you can keep it around your neck and not drop it. Um, and the question I get asked all the time with these, do these wireless controllers float if you happen to drop them in the water? Uh, that would be giving the game away, wouldn't it? Uh, sadly, <laughs> sadly, no, no, they, they don't float. So the lanyard is a key piece of your equipment. Make sure you've got the lanyard clipped in and make sure you've got a hold of it. Because um, as you watch it disappear below the surface, that's when you remember, I wish I put my lanyard on. Yeah, that would be a sad day indeed. Yeah. I, I, think, uh, I think you can offset that if you put a couple of those those floaty keychains that they always give away at the boat show at everybody's stands, you know, attach, attach a few of those to it and uh, that might. Yeah, that's not service. a bad shout. Yeah, good idea, <laughs> not a bad shout at all. So another feature that these autopilots have that um, not many people know about, but I think is actually really cool, especially if you have a big boat, uh, uh, there's some auxiliary steering station controls in, in this case, the P70RS or this other device on the right, um, I think that's called the follow-on tiller. What can you tell us about these guys, Derek? Okay, with the, um, when you've got the autopilot in, uh, in auto, you, you can still 
kind of use it like power steering or you can go the full hog and use the follow on tiller go into power steer mode and this is like a, a full-blown joystick um, for uh, operating your your helm and you can have a number of these on the boat could be on the bridge wings um, could be just on the below station dashboard perhaps um, and that will give you the ability if you like to power steer it when you're navigating through a, a pilotage that's pretty cool i know on some of the bigger yachts and, and some of the big sport fishing boats we have here too they often have these uh con like aft control stations where you have engine throttles but you don't necessarily have a wheel and this is kind of a way to bring the wheel uh back there too yeah absolutely that that would be a perfect use for it that's pretty good and i think there's two modes of operation with these there's something called proportional and the other one is called bang bang steering can you describe for us what the difference is between those yeah absolutely yeah proportional basically is the the further you move the rudder the uh, lever on it the further the rudder will move uh, and when you bring it back to midships the rudder will come back to midships in bang bang steering you move the the lever the rudder will move and then it stops where you left it and you've got to make a point of actually moving the lever in the opposite direction to bring the rudder back to midships so there, there's uses for both of those um Oftentimes they're, they're used in bang bang mode when you're fishing. If you have a load of lines over one side of the boat, you, you obviously need to motor along with a, a set rudder angle to keep the boat in a straight direction. Or maybe you want to motor the boat in a, in a circle if you're trying to gather a net up. So depending on your application, proportional or bang bang could be useful for you. Um, and you can change that within the configuration of the autopilot. Yeah, I think it's pretty easy to make that change. And, and that was actually the first thing that came to mind uh, when you were describing Bang Bang was a, a fishing application and a lot of small commercial fishing boats. Mm. will use an autopilot with uh, a tiller control and Bang Bang steering and that gives them some maneuvering abilities that they might not have otherwise. Yeah, we find it's very popular, uh, particularly in the um, Scandinavian countries and anywhere where there's, there's sport fishing. Very good. So we've kind of looked at all the options and all the pieces of equipment that make up an autopilot system. And I think we've touched on some of this, but I wanted to sort of recap, um, how do I actually choose an autopilot starting from square one? You know, I've come to the boat show, I've talked to Derek and his team on the stand, and uh, I'm ready to pick what I need for my boat. So let's start again with mechanical or cockpit autopilot systems um what's the first piece of information i need to have yeah the, the first thing that i would always ask is after making sure yeah you've definitely got a boat um <laughs> is to find out how big that boat is what what displacement is the boat closely followed up by the second question is what is the steering system on the boat um the third question would be what do you want to do with it um, are you going offshore? Are you coastal? Are you lake? What, what are you doing with it? And then with those three questions, that will start me down the direction of choosing um, whether it's going to be a cockpit pilot is going to be suitable or whether you need to have a below deck pilot. So, you know, you explain about the fully laden displacement. And of course, if you're going offshore, blue water cruising, you're going to have um, stand up paddle boards on the boat, you're going to have food. Uh, drink, you're going to have stores, you're going to have people, fuel, fresh water, um, spares, extra sails, etc, etc. You'll have the plethora of things that you need for your just in case um, when you're offshore. So all of that adds to the displacement and 20 to 25 percent is really a, a good estimate of how much additional you can add to it. You know, you can see the boat go down three or four inches on the marks once you've fully stored up, ready to go. Um, so that gives us an idea, first of all, right, given that displacement, you were kind of near the top end for a, uh, a wheel pilot, maybe. Uh, but actually, now you, you've completely moved into the below decks pilot. Um, personally, I would always go one size of autopilot up as well, simply from the point of view if you're offshore, everything's going wrong, you're shorthanded, when the worst possible combination of circumstances is gonna happen, that's when you need the autopilot to be working for you and it'll be working its, its body out, um, trying to keep that boat in a, in a safe condition on a safe heading for you. 
So I would always want to kind of make sure that I've erred on the side of caution and gone slightly overkill on that size of pilot, just to make sure that I've got the right thing for the job when I really need it. Yeah, that's definitely a, a good tip is yeah, when you're very, very close to that, that upper limit, yep, move up to the next size because yeah, the weather, the weather is something that you can't control and you, you don't know what conditions you're going to face when you're offshore. So, you know, be prepared. Yeah, it, it's absolutely right. And you, you don't have to be a novice. You can be the most experienced yacht master. You can have tens of thousands of ocean miles um, under your hull and a combination of freak circumstances can come together and you, you are totally at the mercy of all of this. So that's when you get to appreciate the fact that the autopilot can steer the boat for you while you're dealing with the other emergencies on the boat, um, taking down sails, shortening sail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, the, and having an autopilot that is actually a replacement for a crew person is really a key to it all. It's pretty good. So ultimately, I guess it comes down to the displacement and the type of steering lead me to the drive unit I need. The drive unit leads me to the ACU that I have to have. And then once I have those in place, I can choose whatever controllers and MFDs and other accessories make me happy. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. The drive is your key. That then determines the ACU, and then you can add on whatever you else um, you need to that. Um, and with a modular system, it's very easy to just keep adding the stuff that you want. And to be fair, some people like to have their autopilot as a standalone. Some people like to integrate it. Um, and that's a further discussion you can then go on to have um, once you've chosen the right autopilot for the boat. Okay. One, one point now, I, I would just oh, yeah. make, Jim, about that, just uh, on the subject, if you're blue water cruising, obviously, um, power is going to be a, a subject close to your heart. Um, you're going to have solar panels, you're going to have um, wind generators and that sort of stuff on board. And, and the power consumption of the pilot is going to be important to you. Um, I would just say that just because you've got a bigger pilot doesn't mean to say you're going to drain the batteries quicker than wing. The point is, the better balanced a boat is, the, the easier you sail a boat. So, you know, try and lay off the wind just a little bit. Um, try and work with the sea conditions a bit more. The easier the motion is for the boat, the less power the pilot will take. And you'll find that even these great big pilots will only be taking a few amps every hour out of your battery. So they could be rated for up to 30 amps, but you could find you're only taking three or four amps. Um, and if you're going really long distances, that's when some people have a combination of two autopilots. They'll have a wheel pilot for when they're ghosting because they're taking very little current. Anything above a force two, they then switch to the main pilot, uh, which does the job properly for them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So kind of back to the boat show again, this time I have a boat with hydraulic steering. So what is the, the baseline factor that I use when I choose a hydraulic autopilot? Yeah, the first thing is going to be the cubic capacity of the ram. Um, if you have a, a twin hull boat, a catamaran, you've got two rams, you'd need to know whether are those rams in parallel or are they in series? Have you got a hydraulic tie bar or have you got a mechanical tie bar? Those things will then determine what the cubic capacity of the ram is. And we can then choose the right size hydraulic pump for it. There is another issue coming on here as well, um, and that's going to be um, servo systems as well, because you, you get some boats where you have a hydraulic system from your, your helm position, and that goes straight down to the steering cylinder. You'll have other systems where you have power assist, and so you have a servo ram. Um, and in those cases, usually you're fitting the uh, autopilot pump on the system that controls the servo ram. And that's when you need things like these half liter, uh, the 0.5 hydraulic pump. Although you might have an 80 foot power boat, because you've got servo assist steering, the autopilot is operating on the servo system and the power assist is then controlled by that servo. So you do need to, with hydraulics, you do need to know a bit more about your steering system, what the configuration is, what the cubic capacity of the ram is. And a little tip here is if there's no label on it, you can see on the ram on the bottom 
uh, of the uh, picture there, there's a, a blue and silver label. Those labels usually have the um, catalog number of the RAM, they, and from that you can find out what the cubic capacity is. Just measuring the outside of the RAM and the length of the stroke won't, won't do it because a lot of RAM manufacturers use the same external diameter and they change the swept volume inside with a different stroke and different thicknesses of the wall. So we need to know what is, in, is on that maker's label of the RAM. If you've got a steering system where there is just nothing, there is a simple little tip you can do is wind the steering fully over to one side Disconnect the ram, the pipe from the opposite end of the ram, and then as you wind the steering back to the other side, you'll get oil will come out of the ram. Catch that in a measuring jug, and you can then work out what the cubic capacity is because that equals the volume of oil that's come into that jug. So there's always a way of finding out what that is. That will then determine your hydraulic pump. Once you know your hydraulic pump, as Jim was saying before, then you know what your ACU is and away you go. You're then into in business. Yeah, just connecting that pipe sounds scary to me. Uh, that's yeah. <laughs> probably what I want to come in uh, and talk yeah. to your team, Derek, and say, what do I got, <laughs> what do I got here? Or, or my, lo my local dealer or boatyard yeah. can probably help with that too. I, I, that's usually the best bet, to be quite honest, because hydraulics is, is quite scary to a lot of people. And you can get yourself into quite a lot of bother. If you use the wrong fluid, you use the wrong tools, um you don't have the right tools you know you can get yourself unstuck really fairly quickly and a little bit of hydraulic oil goes a long long way whether it's in the water or heaven forbid on your teak decks so yeah. with hydraulics it's one of those things if you're not comfortable with leave it alone get a dealer in they know exactly what they need they'll have the right oil the right tools and they'll come with a decent supply of lint-free cloths um, so that if there are any spillages, it doesn't come to any harm. Um, so yeah, hydraulics is, it looks quite simple, but you just got to be aware of what you're getting yourself into. Very good. And when, um, when they're mounting the hydraulic system in the boat, where do they usually put the hydraulic pump? Is there a preferred place for it? You want it forward or aft or up or down or? Yeah, the best, best place for the pump is usually very close to the steering cylinder if you can. It, okay. we, also, we also recommend mounting it so that the hydraulic pump motor is horizontal. Um, these days, there's a bit more flexibility. You can mount it vertically so that the um, pump uh, module and the pipes are at the bottom of the, uh, the motor. Um, but traditionally, a hydraulic pump would always be mounted on a horizontal surface with the pipes coming out the top. So any air that got itself into the pump would always be encouraged to bleed itself up the pipes and out of the way. Um, there are a number of boats, particularly without boards, where there is nowhere at the after or the end to, of the boat to put the pump. And in which case, you've got to put it under the center console. On boats of that size, that's really not a problem. As you get into larger and larger boats with shaft drives and those sorts of things, you'll tend to want to put the pump quite close to the ram. Yeah, I guess it makes sense to keep the piping as, as short as possible that way. Yeah. The connections. Yeah. And, and the other point is use decent quality pipes as well. Um, you've got to go for a burst pressure on those pipes of, of 3,000 or 5,000 PSI. Um, if, you, if you use a very thin walled pipe that isn't up to the pressure, um, you'll lose your hydraulic oil, you lost your steering. Um, so don't be fooled into thinking that, that you can use low pressure pipes for hydraulic steering. Most times the steering's working at around about two to 300 PSI. The problem will come if you hit a bit of debris in the water or um, a log or something like that in the water, you'll get a sudden shock going through the hydraulic steering system. And that's what generates these, these large peak pressures. So be wary about your choice of hoses if you're going to do it yourself. Very good. And of course, you know, if you're looking for an autopilot for your boat and, you know, you're not sure where to begin, um, you know, certainly feel free to reach out to our team, uh, our dealer network, um, and we can kind of get you, get you started down the pathway uh, to what you need for your boat. 
That, that's absolutely right, Jim. There's lots and lots of help available online and through our, our forums and support centers. Um, don't be put off by, by that. Give us a ring and we, we can help you help sort you out or put a, an incident on the forum. We can help you out. Very good. So let's just talk, talk a little bit about some of the features that are in evolution as we kind of close out the webinar here. Um, so in the past, autopilots had lots of little tiny settings to tweak things and adjust things and make, compensate for this and that and the other thing. Our evolution system kind of simplified all that. We've got three modes of operation. Can you tell us a little bit about those modes, Derek? Yeah, the, the whole point behind evolution was to try and demystify some of the autopilot operation and make it as easy as possible. Um, so we got, um, basically you've got three modes. Yeah, you don't have to worry about gain and all that sort of stuff now. We've got leisure, cruising and performance. Um, and basically what this does is it, it changes the, the control algorithms of the autopilot. In leisure, for example, it allows the boat to take a much easier path through the water. Um, if you've got a sea that's constantly knocking the head of the boat off, um, instead of trying to fight that, it allows the boat to move around with the sea, and you'll find it a much more comfortable, much more leisurely performance um, in sailing the boat. Uh, and you typically, you'd use that when you're off the wind um, and you've got plenty of sea room around you. Um, and the, the boat will be beautifully controlled under those conditions. On the other hand, you may start to uh, get into a situation where there's a, a few other boats around, a bit of close quarters, maybe you're coming into a channel and that's where you perhaps select cruising. Um, the autopilot here now starts to work harder. Um, it, it doesn't allow the boat to move around so much uh, with the sea and with the wind and tide, you know, those sorts of things. And it will keep the boat on a, on a slightly tighter course, but without causing the autopilot to constantly be working all the time. And then you have performance. Performance is when, you know, you, you're, you're in a very restricted situation, the seas are very awkward, perhaps you've got a quartering sea or following sea, uh, or maybe it's really important you stick to that channel, that course. Um, if you've ever been in some of the fairways between islands, you, you've got maybe a channel that's 40 feet wide, you, you know, you've got to stay in that course. Um, and that's when performance really comes in. The pilot is then working really hard. You're going to obviously going to be using a lot of current from the autopilot, um, but it's going to be keeping you on a much, much tighter heading. In leisure, where the pilot's not working so hard, that's when you're going to have the most economical operation. It's kind of interesting. This feature always reminded me of um, kind of the, the drive control mode you see in a lot of modern cars, a lot of sports cars or, or luxury cars, and you have your track mode and track plus and, and yeah. touring mode and whatnot. And this is kind of doing the same thing. It's changing the performance characteristics of the autopilot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's a good analogy, yeah. So let's look at the most basic mode of operation of the autopilot. Uh, steer to a heading. So what, what are we doing here on steer to a heading, Derek? Yeah, basically all we're doing here is the EV1 um, sensor is picking up a magnetic heading um, and it's feeding that through to the ACU and we've told the boat we're going to steer that heading of 295 degrees. Um, and if the wind knocks us off the heading, the autopilot will correct and bring us up. If the tide um, starts to set us to one side, as long as we're still steering 295, the autopilot won't change. So you've just got to be aware of the situation around the boat. Um, but this is the most basic operation. And it's as simple as I press auto to follow that heading. I press standby to take over manual steering. And if I want to change that heading, all I do is I just turn that rotary knob that changes what we call the locked heading on that display. You can see the, the, um, the acronym there, LH, and that stands for locked heading. And all I'm doing is I'm gonna change that locked heading. The autopilot would change the heading of the boat and I'll then steer that autopilot heading. And what we're showing is here, I'm steering 295 degrees magnetic. And I know we can also integrate the pilot with uh, a GPS or a chart plotter. And this is a very popular function. So 
Um, here, I guess the autopilot is going to be linked using CTOK NG or NEMA 2000. Um, what kinds of things can I do between the chart or GPS and the autopilot, Derek? Yeah, what I've done here is we've we've put a route in, um, and the the autopilot once it's engaged and in track mode, which I can select from either the multifunction display if if it's got those functions, or from my control unit, I'll then steer to the target waypoint. And in the the diagram we've got showing on one side here, um, the target waypoint number one has got a, uh, a square around it. That's how I know that I'm always steering to that particular waypoint. If it's got a square around it, that's my target. And so I'll engage track mode and I'll steer towards it, regardless of what the wind and tide are doing to my boat. So my locked heading here will be changed by the multifunction display so that I stay on that track, that straight line towards that target waypoint. And once I reach that target waypoint, I'll get an alarm. There's, I can create a, an alarm zone around that target waypoint. I'll get an alarm saying I've reached the waypoint and I've now got an option to go to the next waypoint, number two. And I acknowledge the alarm and it will take me to waypoint two and so on. So I can steer my way along this route. Obviously, if I'm a sailing boat, I would hope to have set a route in that allows the boat to sail it. If I'm in a power boat, well, it really doesn't matter. I, I can follow that route. Um, the only things I need to be really worried about here is the water depth. Um, and I can take note of that if I uh, use auto routing, uh, but that's another topic for another day, I reckon. And let me ask you, Derek, when you're following a route, will the autopilot change course automatically when the waypoint advances or do I have to? Um, no, it won't. We've, we've elected for the uh, autopilot to give an alarm when it reaches that point so that the customer, the user, is aware that the ship's heading is changing. And it's up to you as the user then. The skipper is always responsible. Um, and you need to have a look on the next route. The autopilot and the GPS, the MFD, will tell you what the bearing is to the next waypoint. And it's up to you to look along that bearing. Is it clear? If it is clear, then you accept the alarm. The autopilot will then turn you onto it. We figure out that if you're not looking out the window to see if it's clear, then we'll just carry you on in a straight line because you're clearly not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, it is important definitely to, uh, to, to heed that alarm, take a look and make sure it's clear to turn. That, you know, there'd be nothing worse than turning uh, turning across somebody else's bow or uh, causing a collision because you weren't paying attention to where the boat was going. Yeah, it could be. Since I, I created that route, it could be that a commercial ship has decided that's a great place to anchor and he's anchored right in the middle of your route. Yeah, definitely a case where you wouldn't want it to turn without you knowing about it. Yeah, absolutely. So let's take a look at a couple of sail specific autopilot features. Uh, steer to a wind angle. I know, I know this is actually pretty popular with sailors running under autopilot. What's the theory behind steer to wind angle? What's it doing for us? Yeah, what it's doing is it's compensating for the, those little wind shifts and wind changes that happen. Um, so one of the things you need to be aware of, obviously, is if you're on a river or you're very close to the coast, the wind shear can change dramatically as you go past headlands and those sorts of things. So you do need to keep an eye on uh, what's happening with the wind and the direction of the boat because that, that could change things dramatically for you. But as it, once you, you've got a reasonably steady wind, then this enables you to trim the boat down to the, the best condition that you want it, trim it as sweetly as you can, and the boat will then sail beautifully and you have a little wind shift here or there and the boat's heading will change to keep that apparent wind, or you can choose to use true wind, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, to keep that, that wind angle the same, so you don't have to keep retrimming the sails. Depending on whether you're sailing upwind or downwind, you may prefer to use true wind, particularly if you're sailing downwind and you've got a bit of a seaway running. If you're using apparent, you'll go surfing off down a wave, the apparent wind angle will change. So the autopilot will be constantly changing your heading and you'll have a risk of either going head to wind or maybe broaching. Um, so in those conditions, you'll use the true wind. 
And that's where having a network system really comes into play because you're not only using your wind information, you're using your boat speed information as well as your compass information. And that will enable you to calculate the correct true wind. So even though the boat is accelerating down a wave and then stopping at the bottom, your wind angle will always remain the same and you'll, you'll sail a true course. Interesting. So I know we have an extension of that too, where we can actually have the autopilot perform attack for us automatically. Um, so I guess this is using the wind vane as well, and maybe some of the other sensors on the boat. What are some of the applications for auto attack? Yeah, this is a, a great feature, especially if you're short-handed on a boat. Um, and depending on the rig of your boat, there can be any number of things you need to do while you're attacking the boat. So leaving the autopilot to get on and tack the boat for you using the wind information takes care of that and it steadies the boat up on the, the opposite tack, giving you time to get your sheets in, to get your sails trimmed properly. Um, depending on if you're on a mono hull, you may even have uh, a high performance mono hull, for example, you may have a tacking rudder where you need to, to change the angle of the rudder depending on the heel angle of the boat. There's any number of things that could also be going on while you're tacking. So having the autopilot auto tack is a great feature and it uses the wind information to mirror the tack angle. So whatever angle you're, you're on on one tack, it'll mirror that on the other tack. That's pretty good. And I see that there's a feature in there called jibe inhibit. Can you just briefly tell us what's a jibe and, and why would I want to inhibit that? Yeah, oh yeah, this, this could be exciting. Um, if, if you just got things slightly wrong um, and got yourself slightly confused, uh, tacking is where the bow of the boat passes through the wind and it's generally quite a controlled uh, behavior. Um, you know, the sails will obviously flap as you go head to wind but you can generally control those sails and you can do it in a, in a very efficient controlled manner. Jibing can also be controlled, but is rather more exciting. It's where you, you turn the boat away from the wind. Uh, and basically what that means is that instead of um, being able to control the, the, the head sail and the main sail as the boat swings through the wind, you'll find that the wind will suddenly go around the back of the main sail and it will swing that mainsail over really quite violently. Depending on the wind conditions, you, you can even get as far as breaking the battens in your sail, ripping your sail. Sometimes you can even take the mast down. So a jibe, if it's not managed correctly, can be a very bad thing. Managed well, it, it's a piece of cake. Um, and depending on how proficient the sailor is, you, you may turn it off. But for most people, Putting jibe inhibit on means that if you mistakenly press the auto tack the wrong way on the control unit, the autopilot simply won't turn the boat um, and it prevents you from jibing. And um, I had one customer who wanted me to demonstrate this on his 40 foot high performance uh, boat. And um, yeah, it was kind of interesting. And when nothing happened, he said, so what went wrong there? And I said, well, nothing. <laughs> you didn't want it to jibe, so it didn't jibe. It so didn't it works. It. All right. Oh, okay. And I said, just don't even suggest turning it off and trying to jibe then, because I'm not taking any responsibility for your sales. <laughs> <laughs> and I got one last set of features I wanted to take a peek at during our webinar today. And this is the trolling pattern. So fishing guys, I know you're still on the line watching and you've been waiting for this. Um, what do I need to make sure that I have available to the autopilot to take advantage of all these automatic trolling patterns? Yeah, you, you need to have a GPS because somewhere uh, in, the, in the network, the, the autopilot needs to know where you're starting from so that it can figure out what it needs to do in order to achieve whichever of those uh, patterns, fishing patterns you, you wanna use. So GPS is essential for this. Yeah, this is a pretty cool uh, function to have, uh, especially if you're doing a lot of, you know, coastal fishing, big water fishing. Um, it, you know, can handle all, all these patterns automatically. And there's a lot of parameters you can adjust as well. So if you want to make the radiuses uh, longer, or the legs longer, or, you know, orbit to the left, orbit to the right, uh, many different control options there. Um, one other thing that one of our pro ambassadors actually told me about that he likes to do 
is uh, he, anytime he uses the trolling patterns, he likes to turn on the track recorder in the autopilot because you can actually see the pattern getting drawn behind the boat. And uh, it's just a neat way to see, uh, see the pattern in action, see the, the area that you've covered, the area that you fished, and uh, if there's areas that you've missed, it makes it easy to identify where you can go back to. Yeah, there, there is an, another use for um, these, these fishing patterns as well. If you're searching for something, maybe you're looking for a wreck or maybe you're looking for something that went over the side of the boat. Um, so there's, there, there are other uses for these patterns as well. That's very true. Very true indeed. And I think the only uh, other requirement beyond uh, GPS is that you have to be using one of the powerboat profiles to do this. I think if you set the autopilot yeah, up right. for a sailboat, you won't, you won't have these. Uh, that's absolutely right. And, and conversely, um, you won't be able to auto tack your powerboat unless you're in <laughs> sailboat mode. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Oops, went the wrong way. All right, I'm going to open up the Q&A panel. I know some questions have been chatted in while we've been proceeding here. So uh, we'll take a few of these live on the air. And if I don't get to your question uh, live, one of the things I have been doing is following up with you afterwards, because we have your email address when you logged in to the webinar. So I'll try to touch base with you and get answers to all of your questions. But let me pull a few of these uh, out, of the, out of the system. Um, so Derek, with um, a bigger networked system, what are some of the advantages of connecting together uh, instruments, chart plotter, and the autopilot together? This is a question that Lee chatted in. I think it's a pretty good one. Yeah, um, it, it's all a question of sharing data. Um, you can, of course, run everything isolated, and, uh, and that's fine. Uh, but once you start networking everything, um, you then have the ability to share data and calculate uh, functions as well. So, um, you know, things like distance made good, course made good, um, there's a lot of other functions that, that are the sum of a number of uh, sensors and displays together. Um, one of the other major benefits, of course, is that everybody on the boat is looking at the same information. It's like if you have a look around your house right now uh, at your clocks, unless, of course, you've got a network clock system, every one of your clocks, I guarantee, will be slightly different to the next one. Um, you network them all together, everything's on the same page telling the same information. And that's the beauty of a network system. You can use all the same raw data and then on the displays, you, you can configure that to suit. So you could have somebody working on an MFD down below decks, uh, producing um, some type of screen information for them. And that's not affecting the navigator working on the other station um, using the same data, but you're both looking at the same information. Very good. Um, another great question here. This was chatted in by Brett and Brett, Brett's actually got, he's got two problems here. So he wants to know um, if he can follow a route or a waypoint from his chart plotter. Um, but the bigger problem is, is that he doesn't have a Raymarine chart plotter. He's got somebody else's. So we can easily fix that part, Brett. But uh, in the meantime, can, can, can you integrate a third party GPS or chart plotter with one of our autopilots? What's the best way to do that, Derek? Yeah, you, you can. Um, so if we're, we're talking about an Evolution autopilot, an Evolution uses NMEA 2000 or CTORC NG. So if your third party uh, plotter has a NMEA 2000 um, connection on it, then yeah, you, you can connect that into the same network um, using probably device net to CTORC NG uh, cables. If it's uh, an older style um, MFD or it doesn't have NMEA 2000, so it's using um, NMEA 0183, then you will need to have an, uh, an NMEA 0183 interface um, to link through to the pilot. Um, there's a number of companies, Mertron and ActiSense are, are two, and they make uh, NMEA 2000 to uh, NMEA 0183 interface, uh, works both directions. And then you can, um, you won't have the same degree of control as if you were using a Raymarine chart plotter, but you can still put that chart plotter into track mode, follow that route, and the autopilot you can then put into track mode. It will receive the 
things like cross-track error, bearing to waypoint information, distance to waypoint, etc. So provided the right sentences are being output on enemy A0183, then yes, you, you could follow that route. Very good. And I've got uh, one more here that I'm going to take live. And again, um, if we didn't get to your question live on the air here, I have all the questions captured and I will uh, get back to you after the webinar via email uh, to try to get answers to all your questions. This last one is from Brian and his question is about the compass lock feature. So we know that evolution um, auto calibrates as soon as you turn it mm -hmm. on it begins uh, sampling the deviation uh, around it. Um, Brian wants to know when, when and how would you turn on the compass lock feature? Is there a particular strategy for that? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, Jim, the, the evolution heading sensor is constantly trying to improve its picture um, of the deviation around it and constantly trying to update it to give you the very best um, heading data coming out of it. There are a number of things that can disturb that. Um, for example, if you've ever taken your, your boat um, near a wind farm, there are subsea cables that carry enormous currents and voltages, um, and they have incredibly powerful magnetic fields. If you sailed right up alongside a, a commercial steel tanker or a um, steel pile um, arrangement, that will cause the EV sensor to temporarily change it, its deviation picture. Um, and so in those cases, what we would suggest is having gone through and got a good deviation of what's local to the boat and always going to be on the boat and relative to the boat, you could lock that uh, compass then at that point. And even if you do go past a, a very large deviating force, for sure your heading will, will change just like the heading would on any other form of compass, but you won't upset the deviation signature of your boat uh, and affect your boat. So um, those are the circumstances I would use to use that lock feature. And that lock feature, I think, is just in the uh, calibration menu of the autopilot. You just go in through the controller and, uh, and you can lock it or unlock it uh, as needed. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you all for the questions today. And again, um, I will follow up with some of you afterwards with uh, anything we didn't get to live on the air. So as we wrap things up today, uh, I just wanted to kind of review with you the ways that you can get in touch with Raymarine and FLIR Maritime. We do have a lot of resources uh, online uh, as well as uh, in person or by phone. Um, so you can certainly check out raymarine.com. Also our technical support forum is a great resource for all types of questions, uh, tips, um, a lot of feedback from, uh, from customers and other users of our products. You can find that at forum.raymarine.com. Uh, of course, we are available by phone and email, and we are on social media too. So pretty much any network that you like, whatever you prefer, you can find us there by searching on the keyword Raymarine or some slight variations of it. And lastly, if you enjoyed today's webinar, if you're a first timer, uh, we've been doing these for many weeks now. Uh, we have quite a library of 2020 webinars built up. You can binge watch all of them on our replay channel this weekend. Uh, pop some popcorn, uh, get a blanket, snuggle up on the couch with a loved one and watch all your favorite Raymarine webinar replays. <laughs> it's at raymarine.com slash webinars, or you can find them over on our YouTube channel. Uh, we're at youtube.com slash Raymarine Inc. And uh, you can see some of uh, Derek and I's previous greatest hits on there. Uh, I hope you check those out and uh, certainly uh, feel free to leave us comments and feedback and questions. So we're going to wrap it up for today. I want to thank you all for joining us and uh, sticking on the line with mm. us. Well, we kind of thank went you. long today. It was a good discussion. Um, and I love the questions and answers. Uh, Derek, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And uh, I know you're up late on a Friday to uh, help us out. Uh, we'll cut you loose so you can go have some dinner. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant, Jim. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. 
All right, thank you everyone. And uh, if you are not already uh, receiving email and social media posts for us, feel free to uh, pop on to our webinar channel, raymarine.com slash webinars. You can actually sign up for our mailing list and you'll get notifications about next week's webinar. So until then, signing off, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys.